Hello, everybody. Welcome along to the Championship Check-In Podcast. Looking at all the goings-on in the most ridiculous league in world football. Sam, another entirely logical 12 games in the Championship to end another entirely logical um, three-game week. And um, we're setting this up now. Three rounds remaining, Mr. Parkin. How are you? I'm good, yeah. Like, my mind just feels a little bit hazy. I suppose it would be so much more straightforward if we were sitting here on a Monday morning. It would be duller, but sitting here talking about the top three winning and the bottom seven losing. I know that some of these teams are playing <laughs> each other, but it's just incredible. Like, every week you're having to readjust, like, <laughs> what you're thinking. Like, who's going to go? Who's going to go up? It's just... Just astonishing. Plus, I think I'm still getting over my uh, my trip to Devon on Friday night. It, uh, Ooh, which we're come, gonna hear comes about. back to um, yeah, it affects you for a couple of days, isn't it? I forgot that, <laughs> given that I'm not well, playing anymore. Big re- but yeah. big respect to all the Plymouth fans. Um, we have decided that we, we we did go through a little while of just recording on Mondays and getting the show up, but we are live. Um, we really did enjoy the buzz and the interaction from you guys last week. So if you're listening after the fact. We're probably going to keep things live and, you know, people can still then view as they like afterwards. If you are here live in the stream, which we can see many of you are already, uh, we'll do some questions for Sam. Get your comments and we'll raise a couple of them. But let's not stand on ceremony anymore. Let's go to Parkin's pick. What are we leading off with this week, Sam? Well, yeah, I think everyone can have their say from far and wide about the teams potentially going to get into the Premier League, but it's the bottom of the table that's uh, really been just incredible, isn't it? So let's have a chat about the most recent results, the big movers at the weekend, the big losers. Who's going to... Come on, someone's got to go. Who's going to be departing <laughs> this division with Rotherham? Feels like... We've done this. I'd love to someone to make a montage of all the times we've done this this season. But it has just been when you compare it back, Sam, to some of the other relegations where we've kind of known in January sometimes who mm. you know who the three teams are going to are going to be. But here we are, three games to go, and you already mentioned it in your kind of monologue at the beginning, Sam. Four wins in the bottom nine once again. Now, we've got a lot to talk about, so I won't go chapter and verse on every team. First question to you, Sam. Great wins for Millwall and Blackburn, who are now 16th and 17th from 50 and 49. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Are we today ruling off Millwall and Blackburn with 50 and 49 points, and just talk about um, their weekend results for me, please. Um, I don't know. I don't know what that bar is going to be set at now after the most recent. I think 49 was probably my sentiment last week. I don't know. It might have shifted to 50 now. So maybe some work to do for for Blackburn still. Um, Yeah, incredible win. Obviously, I think reliant on a bit of luck, obviously, at, at Leeds a really good goalkeeping performance and I've been a bit, um, yeah, I've probably taken them to task a little bit in that department this season, Blackburn. don't think that they've been brilliant. Um, the goalkeepers, but um, Pears was was really good, made some good saves, changed the shape. So, yeah, no no surprise really going to get an extra centre-half in there when you're playing one of the big guns and, and Carter, I think, makes a, a big difference to, to Blackburn. And you could look at the chances and, Although Leeds had far and away more shots and, you know, that Bamford header was probably the most glaring one or the shoulder. But Smodic's arguably had as good a chance as anything that that um, Leeds created before they before they scored. So he got in for a good one. I think Blackburn only, maybe only had the three attempts or something. So no surprise there. But yeah, colossal, colossal victory for him, especially when and you Sam, consider... We didn't like their fixtures remaining after no. this either, did we? So it's a hell of a win, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I was about to say what so Sheffield Wednesday and then, then, then Coventry and Leicester, wasn't it? Um <laughs> the Coventry game, obviously the narrative is probably gonna change behind that. Um, 
In fact, I'm feeling like maybe they've um, run their race. Um, so, yeah, amazing win for, for Blackburn. Didn't really see it coming, although, you know, they won at Sunderland handsomely and they, they played really well in that Southampton goalless draw. So, yeah, maybe like all these teams, just you've got to look at the individual game on the merit, cut them a little bit of slack. Um, and Millwall, obviously, I will talk about this in more glowing terms when I uh, reveal to anyone who missed last week's podcast that I actually not only predicted the result of this. Oh, bonus but the... point. And I think I said that old Ob- Oberfemi was going to come good as well. So he did. just a magic week for, for Millwall. Um, getting pegged back in this one as well. Jake Cooper getting a bit of a rare goal these days. Um, he's been getting a little bit of criticism. I think the the um, the want to hit him from every set piece has not been as fruitful as it once was for Millwall. So that was interesting seeing him and then a nice moment for Duncan Watmore and the Millwall fans to to get that goal and and yeah but Sam with that fifty come on there is no way um, and look at the goal difference where as well Sheffield Wednesday um, and Huddersfield would need seven points from three games to go past them and Birmingham would need six from three games it's I I just see I think Millwall can lose all their games now and. You know, there's there's just not going to be that swell from below them, I don't think, Sam. No, and he, he got a factor in, which is difficult and probably adds to the haze in my mind this morning. You've got a factor in that these teams are all playing each other as well somewhere. Uh, Only that. QPR, Sam, don't have a head-to-head. Yeah, so teams are going to take points off each other. It's going to practically become impossible for some of these teams to... To, to accumulate the points to, to catch the likes of Blackburn and Millwall. So, yeah, massive week for him. Didn't really see it coming. And again, just a incredible um, example of, I suppose, football fans, modern football fans. Neil Harris wasn't the man a week ago, was he? And all of a sudden, um, he's completely, in particular, revitalised their home form, which, yeah, clearly that has been miles away from the successful campaigns they've had in the championship. I mean, you know, it's been terrible really in comparison. So to get two home wins is, um, is really special for the supporters and almost there. Right. So you were there on, uh, let's do with Plymouth on their own. And we'll try not to make this segment run too long, but there's so much to talk about. You were there for an incredible win for Plymouth. And I know we're going to talk about the top of the table after we've done this segment, but we were all worried. Um, I think we even put it out as a clip. Will Plymouth's manager gamble pay off? Back to bang, back to back mm. wins and back to back clean sheets. And yeah, they probably could have gone behind against Leicester. You're going to know that way better than me. But they're on to 48 now. <laughs> Just looking at that next one, Stoke away. I can think of a million reasons why Plymouth fans are going to want to win that one. And then they've got Millwall as well, but maybe it's better that Millwall are um, maybe already going to be safe by that point. But what... I mean, sorry, excuse me, it's not back-to-back wins, but it is seven points in three games for um, Plymouth. Um, 48 points, Sam. I I think they're okay, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I had a bit of an episode getting into the car park on on Friday night, and I was uh, subsequently, I was going to say heckled, but there was a, a fan of the show, or certainly a listener to the to the show, shouted that uh, he did certainly take the draw, which was what I okay. predicted um, this to be the outcome. Um, so that that was nice, and then yeah, I think everything that you know gets written about the siege mentality that can be created at, at Argyle was really evident to me uh, on the night. Again, you know, there was a period early on when when Leicester got through the lines, through the middle of of, of Plymouth, and I thought that was quite ominous. And then they those two wire players just narrowed off a little bit, uh, Whitaker and, and Bundu, and I think that gave them that you know that box midfield that we talk about so often, probably initially under Mark Robbins and then um, at Coventry, and then Stephen Schumacher played it a lot at, at Argyle, and that just stopped them a little bit in their tracks, meant that they had to go wide. And I think even the early substitution, Edwards on for, for Miller, wasn't the worst thing in the world. Edwards and um, Barley Mumba have played so much at wing back. I think they had good support to those outside centre halves. And they did well to negate Mavadidi once more. 
and Fatawi, who didn't really have that impact that I anticipated after him coming off the bench at Millwall. Still, I worried for Argyle that they weren't really progressing the ball at the pitch. That connection between the rest of the team, I thought Forshaw was brilliant, by the way, in midfield. I thought his calmness, his experience, his pass for the, obviously, the, the only goal of the game was brilliant. I thought he was excellent, but I did worry about them getting too camped in. How are they going to get up? How are they going to still continue to pose a little bit of a threat uh, once they, they've gone a, ahead and still had an hour or so to play? But I thought the tactical change from the um, from the interim, Neil Jusnip, was brilliant. Essentially, he had four centre-halves across the back line. Galloway, Scar, Gibson, Plegazuelo, memory serves, and then those two wing-backs. So they, they know that role, don't they? They just tucked in. It was like a back six at times. Um, and I thought Ben Wayne really added some energy as the, as the forward run, and, runner, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And Hardy just can't complete games, can he? The way that he plays because he's just you know, he's he, he's a goal scoring threat, but he's just a nuisance and he just runs so much. So, um, I thought he got his sub spot on, I thought he got his tactics spot on. And I'll leave Leicester for a little chat later on. <laughs> Br- brilliant, brilliant win, you know, and um, it's amazing what. It's amazing what a spirit can do, you know, when everyone's unified. So, yeah, enjoyed my trip there, deserved their win and eating a bit of humble pie, me, because I thought they were gone, didn't I, a few weeks ago? Well, strange days um, indeed. Right. So two more before we get down to the bottom four where there is a two-point gap. And, I mean, I've been here a million times, Sam. I said Plymouth was safe when they got 40 points, you know, probably eight games ago, whatever it was. I thought QPR was safe when they were 16, three games ago. Um, So we've now got QPR and Stoke on 47. And then there's that little two-point gap down, which does make me feel if you're QPR and Stoke and you win one more game, Mm. you're all right, aren't you, hitting that? 50 point mark which you you know you're asking a lot of Birmingham Huddersfield and and Wednesday yeah. then aren't you um bit of a disappointment though um for Rangers one point in the last three games Stoke haven't won in four either Sam um Rangers Preston home Leeds home mm. Coventry away as you pointed out might be a dead rubber Stoke Plymouth home Southampton away Bristol City home, I think that's a dead rubber on the last game of the season. Uh, you can see both of those two sticking one more win or two more draws on to get to 49 or 50? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm trying to like give myself a bit of clarity this morning. And you're looking at that bottom four, even with Birmingham's win, I'm thinking it could be between, um, sorry, I, uh, obviously Rotherham are gone, but it could be between Sheffield Wednesday, Huddersfield and, and Birmingham now. That said... QPR 100% bang right back in trouble if they don't beat Preston at the weekend. That all of a sudden becomes an enormous game. And I suppose the the saving grace to a degree, I don't know if it's a saving grace, but it's a 515 kickoff. So Preston's oh, fate I know what's happened. Right. will probably be decided because they're at Southampton obviously Tuesday night and then Norwich will have played before them. And I think if they were to lose at St Mary's and if Norwich were to win their game at three o'clock on Saturday, that's them done. I think there's right. not enough points to to play for. So that could play into QPR's hands, um, into the to, to everyone else's um, thought process. So for, th- for that reason, QPR will be hoping for that. But yeah, I thought they were poor at the weekend. Um, scored four in the last seven. Obviously one point from the last three. Um I would probably question the goalkeeper on the first one. I know we're probably going to talk about that later on. Um, two fans goal. And ultimately, I think, yes, Sheffield Wednesday at home was disappointing, but they probably could have won at Sunderland relatively recently. I think that was a missed chance and they probably could have won at Argyle. Obviously, I spoke to a lot of people down in Plymouth on Friday and they didn't think they were particularly at the races uh, in midweek. QPR had the game won um, and it was a goalkeeping mistake. And obviously, an own goal off a dome that gave them a share of the spoil. So, in typical QPR fashion, they'll probably lose at home to Preston and go and beat Leeds the following Friday. But um, <laughs> for everyone of a similar blue and white persuasion to me, 
I prefer them to get it done this Saturday. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a collapse, isn't it, over the last three? With Stoke, that I mean, we'll talk about Malport in matchup later. That game against Plymouth is just so massive for so many reasons, especially if Southampton, which you know you've got to travel to Southampton in round forty-five. If Saints are still in with a sniff, and again, we'll discuss that later in the the show that they might all of a sudden be again. Mm. Just don't lose to Plymouth. Southampton away is hard, and then are they in it on the last day, Sam? Mm. Yes, yeah, I suppose it's just that lack of cohesion with Stoke, isn't it? The lack of the lack of consistency. I think it's one win in six. You, you just don't know what they're really going to churn out. I think they could have been out of sight here at Sheffield Wednesday in the in the first half. Um, so credit to them for for sticking in, getting a point. I don't think it was a particularly front-footed performance, which you would expect maybe from Stephen Schumacher in different circumstances, but his needs must at the moment, staying in the division. And there's not a great deal else I can I can add about them. You know, looking ahead to this weekend, you've got two guys who I'd imagine know each other's football philosophies, um, thought process on setups, tactics, better than probably anyone else. The other one's boss up until a a while ago, right? Yeah, exactly. So these two are going to be incredibly well aligned. Uh, Whether that means that, um, yeah, there'll be a little bit of, I don't know, cat and mouse. You know, maybe someone could throw a little bit of a surprise into the mix, but it's it's, um, clearly a really good narrative, isn't it, for for everyone watching on and you just don't know with Stoke, do you? You just don't know that, you know, they're, they're, they're liable to throw in a, all of a sudden, a, you know, a decent performance, but then they went and lost at Swansea by, by three goals to nil. So yeah, this weekend's massive. Um, I don't know, would they take the point again? Probably would, wouldn't they? Yeah. And when you were talking about that, we're going to come on to Wednesday now. It was just vital. They did not lose to, uh, Wednesday at Hillsborough, wasn't it? Because the, the the draw is fine, isn't it? It's the three point swing. If Wednesday had have had have beaten them, obviously at the weekend, right? So here's where the real action was, and here's where the real action is going to be now in these um, remaining three rounds. So Birmingham had a really, frankly, I don't know if you agree with me, Sam. You can answer in a minute. Maybe the biggest win of the weekend, if it, maybe Blackburn at Leeds, I don't know. But given where Birmingham are and that performance to beat Coventry in the way they did was absolutely tremendous. Huddersfield, so, so close to winning at Bristol City. And I know you have comments to make on the nature of the um, equalising goal there for Bristol City. And Wednesday, you've already mentioned, um, Sam, the just too many draws, and that would have been the one, wouldn't it? If they'd beaten uh, Stoke, Wednesday would be on 46, wouldn't they? Stoke would be on 45, and Wednesday would have been out of the bottom three. Before you answer, Sam, really quickly, Sheffield Wednesday, Blackburn away, West Brom at home, Sunderland away, mm. Huddersfield, Swansea at home, and then, my God, Birmingham at home, round 45 for Huddersfield. Ipswich away on the last day of the season. Birmingham, now this might be the key game, is Rotherham away. Because is that the one where Birmingham can push themselves to 48 points and they've got a massive advantage if they do? If not, then Birmingham versus Huddersfield becomes, and they're away as well, becomes the mother of all relegation six-pointers. Birmingham will face Norwich on the final day of the season. We already think Norwich are probably going to be in the playoffs. Sam? There is the two-point gap. What the hell do you make of this now with 21st, 22nd and 23rd? <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? I think you can look at you can look at all the teams and and um, make positive cases for them being able to get out of it and accumulate points because, you know, not many of them are playing like top teams that are going for things. Um, there's there's points to be to be won there, even, you know, for Sheffield Wednesday and their fixtures. Um I thought Birmingham would win at the weekend. I don't know if I did say that. I think I said Coventry would probably win at Birmingham. But I think that Birmingham survival hopes were going to come from some victories at home at St Andrews. So, you know, I was surprised by the magnitude of the win. I don't think they probably had three goals goals in them. Spoke about maybe not negative lineup, but maybe the lack of creativity in the last lineup 
um, across the, the, the front position. So it was interesting to see Gary Rowett rejig it. Um, Bielik was in the back four, uh, centre half, and then to reintroduce Tyler Robertson and Keshi Anderson, who was very good, I thought was quite an interesting roll of the dice for them. And, and it, it obviously, you know, paid off in a in a big way. They've they've also got obviously the seven goal better goal difference than than Huddersfield, which invariably could come into play, which which meant that that victory w- was even greater really at the weekend. But um, yeah, it was it was a brilliant win. And um, he obviously puts them in in good stead for the um, for the games ahead. Um, Huddersfield, yeah, I don't think they conceded much on their own goal. I think Tom Lee's coming back in. I read was was a really good move, and and credit to him because I don't think he's played much football. Certainly, probably wasn't at full fitness. Um, I look at that side with Jonathan Hogg out for the weekend now, and there's quite a youthful look to the midfield and the forward positions. Obviously. Huddersfield always had, you know, decent experience in in the back line and in, in the goalkeeper. But um, yeah, that's I think that's an interesting point just at this stage of the season. A little bit of, you know, maybe uh, inexperience there, but does that free up the mind and, and free up some of those players on on the flip side? But um, yeah, I mean, this game should have been done at Bristol City. I think that's clear as day. So they have to take you know, a little bit of criticism for not getting the the job done. But yeah, we've seen two in a week now, haven't we? I mean, when I saw that penalty decision flash up, I couldn't believe that was, that was given. Um, Yeah. I I don't like those ones ever, you know, if it's quite close proximity and as a defender flinging themselves at it, you know, even if it, even if it does strike the arm, um, I think it was relatively close to the player's body. I didn't think it was a penalty. Um, and I think that that's really harsh on Huddersfield, really harsh. That could have been a enormous three points. So they're the ones, aren't they? Probably right now above anyone else in that um, relegation mire. Sheffield Wednesday got a point, um, played pretty well for for a half, and um, yeah, Huddersfield players will be reeling. Right. So the way I'm seeing this now is um, if I'm Sheffield Wednesday or a Huddersfield fan, I'm thinking probably four points, four points to take you to 48 would get you in contention on the basis others are going to others are going to score points as well. It's difficult, Sam. We're probably almost looking for the wrong thing saying that. What might tell us is someone's going to lose all three games, aren't they? And that might be the team that that we're looking at. I always say every year, Sam, there is no relegation chase if the teams below the line don't stick points on the board. But as you've mentioned, I, I can see them. Um, I can see them doing that. Um, do you have any kind of read to round out this um, segment? If we do the points per game route. I think Huddersfield and Wednesday go to like 46.92, which would make 47 your safety total, which mm. maybe then, as you've suggested, Birmingham at Rotherham is the biggest game of the entire running. And um, maybe that locks everything up. But would I be surprised if we got a seven point Sheffield Wednesday or a zero point Stoke or anything like that? No, I wouldn't. Final thoughts, Sam. I don't know, mate. I think I've tried to, <laughs> I've probably tried to, you know, in my mind, think that, you know, QPR will beat Preston, Stoke will maybe, you know, get a point or better against Argyle and then it'll be a little bit more crystal for the last couple of weeks of the season that it'll be, you know, a shootout between Sheffield Wednesday, Huddersfield and Birmingham. But I suppose that that seed of doubt comes from from Birmingham putting on a bit of a, a show against against um, Coventry at the weekend. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I just think, you know, it's ever changing and I'd be a fool to make any strong predictions. So I'm going <laughs> to abstain this afternoon and say thank you to Championship again for providing us with such a marvellous league. Just just insane, isn't it? And all, all it's going to take is a couple of wins at this place of the table and a couple of 
defeats up here and everything's switching around and um yeah maybe we'll be sat here on the final um final show before round 46 sam and be the only time we'll be able to go right i think this is going to happen now and these teams are going to drop but we'll clip that one out sorry it's a bit of a long segment that one but so much to talk about down the bottom there get your comments in if you're watching on the clip thank you everybody who's watching live for their input by the way if you are watching live do hit the thumbs up button and do get your shouts in for worldy of the week ready we'll move through this quickly sam because we're already way behind but it is worldy of the week time so sam i have some suggestions for you mm. i like bundu for plymouth not great defending but love the way he curled it in mm. the corner i like equa for Sunderland, just stroke that one into the top corner um, at West Brom, uh, straight from the corner, really. Uh, I like Sarah from Norwich. Um, lovely dribble into the box and finish. Good narrative on that goal because that was a big goal in a mm. big game as well, wasn't it? We'll come on to talk about that. And I like two of the whole goals. Um, we may or may not be talking about Aussie two fan later, but Philogene as well, great stroke. What did you like um, at mm. the weekend? And um, if you've got them live in the chat, um, I will uh, pop them up as well. Yeah, watching it live, I didn't I didn't realise just how bad the defending was from Leicester for Bundu's goal. Um, you know, watching it in the stadium, you think, oh, here's a great quick counter-attack, an opportunity for Plymouth uh, after not really being in the game as an attacking um, force at that point. So brilliant finish, but I think the defending from Valt Fuss probably takes away a little bit of the... Nice pronunciation, mate. Well, I've heard it pronounced about 7,000 uh, different ways, to be honest. Um, so that was a bit of a stab in the dark. Um, Equa's very good. Sara's, if it gets a better finish. And I know it ends up in the back of the net, which means it was a good finish. You know what I mean, though? I think the goalkeeper should yeah. probably save it. If that gets smashed in the top corner because of the turn, because of the drive, um, the individual nature of it, that probably wins. This may surprise a few. Not some of the people that have been avid viewers because I've been a massive fan of this player. I'm going to go for Philogene. I think that's the better of the whole goals. Why? Because I think Begovic should save the first one. Interesting. We'll come to that later. Well, so I just I just was surprised. You know, if that I think that's got to go right in the corner. And this is being maybe I'm being pernickety here, but I just think it was. You know, it was quite central, a couple of yards in from the post. I just think he's maybe a little bit too far off his line. Um, God, I'm putting myself out there, and I hope there's no ex-goalkeepers watching this. Uh, <laughs> I'm loathe to criticise goalkeepers normally. Um, but, yeah, I just thought the technique of Philogenes was immense. Um, the power he got in it, it's so difficult to strike that ball um, coming at him like that. So that was the one that took me off my seat a little bit. So I'm going to go for Philogene this week. So Philogene is the world of the week. Can we give a quick shout out, Sam, for the Tyrese Dolan assist for the Smodic goal yeah. at Blackburn? That was, um, if it had been a, I know it's a standard finish for Smodic into the middle of the goal, but it's a terrible was... goal for Leeds defensively, isn't it? If you think, I that, know, you can't he turns him around and slides it straight yeah. through, doesn't? Yeah, he? I think it was the. It must have been the right back that had that had vacated the, the space or whatever. But getting done from a flick, someone getting hold of it and playing. The other striker in the other four player in, yeah, brilliant goal, but um, yeah, a bit of a mess defensively. He's not our lover, Jaden Philogene. Once again, we've spoken about him loads um, this season. Is our worldy of the week? Here we go. I bet no one can guess what the meltdown moment is going to be this week. And this is the collective award, Sam. The meltdown moment this week. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose if City and the thump Luton in the Premier League, we could be uh, shoehorning the Premier League top three in as well. Um, yeah, what's happened to the to the top three in the Championship? Or well, what happened at the weekend? It's not just the weekend, was it? Midweek as well. So Leeds nil, Sunderland nil, Leicester losing at Millwall. And I was at, well, you were at Millwall. I was at Ipswich Watford for a nervy nil-nil at Ipswich nearly lost from a, mm. a hoof from the halfway line in the 95th minute as well. And then you get into the weekend, Sam, and this is just, I mean, you can tell me as a professional footballer way better than I can ask you, but just surely this is just psychological now that you see 
one team doing it, which then makes your task harder. And I don't think it's helping any of them as either that they're going one after the other. So we had Leicester, and I mean, you were there. I kind of almost knew when they conceded. I'm like, oh, they're going to mm. lose, aren't they? You know, I don't, they're psychologically in a, in a problem mm. at the moment, uh, Leicester. And then you go to Leeds and you think, this is the hardest game in the championship this season, Leeds away. They've not lost a single one. And then news of that goal comes through. And then you're kind of looking at Ipswich and they start well and Middlesbrough score and a couple of amazing saves from Cladke as well. I know Ipswich had chances in that game and maybe it could have been, mm. you know, an even higher scoring draw. But when you look at when the chances were, Ipswich could have lost lost that one as, as well. What's going on, Sam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just pressure, isn't it? At this stage of the season, like you got to, again, there's so much quality in the league, and I think we saw that again on 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 Friday and Saturday. You, look at look at Middlesbrough. You know, I know Ipswich played better, certainly than Watford performance. Um, made chances in the first half, but look at the form of Latte Lath, for example, as an individual. You know, he looks a complete striker at the moment. Um, so they made it really difficult, and as you say, like Ipswich in the end, we're reliant on Lackey producing. I mean, the first one, um, from the shot, you expect that to go in, and then Clark's header is really forceful, it's probably a decent enough height for the goalkeeper to get there, but it's still an amazing couple of saves. Um, so yeah, just just nerves, I suppose. For Ipswich, you've got Hurst and possibly Burns coming back into the, into the reckoning, um, and obviously, you've got a nice little opportunity to rest a few weary legs so I think it's probably fatigue but more than anything the points just mean so much now so incredibly difficult to maintain the standards and you know put two teams to the sword like they were doing it at Portman Road early part of the season I mean Leicester it's hard because I've kind of my mind's been taken over by Argyle and and kind of you know the noise that I witnessed and I did say like at full time, I tried to su summarise what I was kind of witnessing and and obviously there was enormous elation from all the Argyle supporters and, you know, loads of fist pumping and, and great scenes on the pitch. And then I looked to my right and I don't think I'd seen fury from a set of supporters that I, that I was witnessing from the Leicester supporters as their players went off at the weekend. You know, they're absolutely disgusted really at the, the way that the wheels have fallen off here. I didn't like the kind of individual stick for Dakar, and I'll probably get he's having a nightmare for this. though, Sam, isn't he? Well, he had a nightmare in terms of he missed kind of the one that he sliced his last touch was bad, obviously, and then the one at the near post was good movement. But what about Ellen Road as well? I've still got that in yeah. my mind. Yeah, what I will say, and obviously I watched the striker above probably any other position, and I was a little bit critical of the lack of involvement for Vardy at Millwall. Dakar was at least involved and at least he's making himself available, making nice angles, showing for the ball and they've, they've been able to play into the striker when he's in the team. And he's a little bit, he's quite mobile, so pull into different positions, which Leicester need at the moment to move the opposition around. And I'm not saying he's doing this enough. And listen, this stage of the season, for Leicester, above any other team, the most important thing is getting someone to put the bleeding ball in the back of the net. And he's not doing that, but... I just feel like he's getting really singled out, and I just didn't, I just didn't like that. And then Vardy came on; he did have one good chance, but again, he, he just doesn't really touch the ball. So there is a kind of fundamental um, fault flaw in the Leicester setup at the moment. Um, they're too one-dimensional. Um, obviously, if Mavadidi and, and Fatawu, Dewsbury Hall, maybe he started the game quite brightly down at home park, but once. Argyle have got their distances better. And I think that can happen. You know, early part of a game, it's a bit like, oh, we're playing against incredible footballers here in terms of Leicester. They can move you around. They're you know, really comfortable on the ball. Um, once Plymouth got hold of it and, and got their distances right and got their organisation right, Jewsbury Hall faded. Um, and he doesn't change it. He doesn't change it. It's like for like changes. Um, we obviously spoke about Tom Cannon not getting any minutes recently you know there comes a time I think when he just needs to and you get a little bit of variation with Pereira Ricardo Pereira and that kind of um set up changed indeed he and Dewsbury Hall are back on their kind of right sides if you like where they've had joy this season but still you know there's not enough questions being asked of the opposition when they go behind 
And that's now, what, three times after scoring in 25 consecutive games? Three consecutive away games where they haven't scored, which, well, I was going to say it's not a crisis. I mean, it is kind of a crisis now, isn't it, really? Uh, what you said that really, really interests me, actually, was right at the start when you were kind of positing the idea, I think, that, yes, we get in a regression to the mean from the top three after just ridiculous runs for all of them. I actually quite like the idea as well that maybe the middle of the table's improved as the season's gone on and these games that we're just getting knocked over, you know, Norwich have improved as the season's gone on. Coventry mm. have, haven't they? Middlesbrough mm. are improving now. Bristol City have kind of sorted themselves out after um, Liam Manning arrived. Um, Watford are better under... I, I think you make a really good point that maybe some of the um, teams at the top three were just knocking over and now... Mm taking draws and whatnot. And look, we always get that at the end of the season. Um, the, yeah. Sorry, a few of the teams are in good form, aren't they? I mean, even even Watford down at, at St Mary's, by all accounts in that second half, have really played well. So they're, mm. they're in great form. You know, not, not one, I don't think, under Tom Cleverley, but they're, they're playing some really good stuff. Middlesbrough as well. That was probably going to be... Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Because there'll be disappointment when they don't make it this year, I, I presume. But... They got to a cup semi-final, um, beat Chelsea. And if it wasn't for some injuries and the loss of... They lost Rodgers as well, didn't they, during that period? Mm. Latte Laff was was injured for a good kind of four to six weeks or something. Could have been talking about another playoff campaign for them. So, yeah, absolutely. I think credit needs to go to some of these sides that are turning up and, and producing performances. It's a good segue into Southampton. We'll we'll finish with them. Um because the one thing we do know from this week is that we'd understandably, and I think quite reasonably, up until about Tuesday, we discounted Southampton. But across this week, um, I did the maths yesterday. I think Saints have taken sort of four points out of Leicester, I think, five out of Ipswich and six out of Leeds across the week. So um, I know it's still a tall order. Um, and they're, I still think, Southampton would have to win at Leicester and at Leeds to pass mm. those particular two teams. But we've got to include them back in the conversation now, yeah. haven't we, Sam? That was the one thing we were certain about, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm going to be down there tomorrow night. And I see a few people messaging me like, oh, massive game now. I've got a great game tomorrow night. I wrote them off weeks ago, stupidly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like if they beat Preston and beat Cardiff, which are the two games which you'd maybe go, well, yeah, they'll probably do that. Oh, you'd be confident that they can do that. Even if Leicester beat West Brom um, at the weekend, um, I think if they if they can beat Leicester in that game in hand, they're one, they're point, one behind. point behind them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and they go within a point going into the final two, which just go, and then we've seen... And they play the, Leeds in the final two yeah. as well. And so That's Leeds, crazy. we don't know what, you know, I'm kind of predicting what Leicester are going to do, but yeah, we don't know what where Leeds are going to be sitting um, at that stage. So... Yeah, if they could go, if they could go to the last game, let's say, or the last two, just having to win their games and and hoping that Leicester, a another slip up. Oh my my goodness, this would just be amazing. And you know, like I said, I think despite losing to almost the last kick of the game, you know, Watford did really well at the weekend, and I think there was an anxiety around St Mary's, probably a frustration that they don't you know dominate. You know, dominate the ball, but don't dominate in terms of chances and scoring goals for, you know, consistent enough periods. And, um, yeah, I think for half an hour, they were pretty good and um, had to rely on yet another late goal. 18 in the last 10 minutes. That even surpasses your mob, Ben. Oh, uh, lucky old Ipswich, eh? Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah. It's great to chat about it, Sam. I And I said even like three, four weeks ago, if Southampton pile through this, I'm coming on here, stand innovation. That is going to be one of the greatest runnings I've ever seen. I'm still saying that right now because I, it's at least, if not 15 points, 13 points from five, including wins at, you know, current sort of, um, where are Leicester? Um, let me bring my table up, sorry. can't remember which order. Ever. But current second and third team. So I still think it would be incredible for Southampton to do it. But yeah, they're, they're back in the conversation. Anyway, uh, get your thoughts in. We'll clip that one out as well. And um, we're actually going to include that as the mouthwatering matchup as well, because 
just the context of everything depends on Southampton versus Preston, which, as we're recording, occurs tomorrow. And there's a chance, Sam, if um, you know, if Preston gets something there, we're we're ruling Southampton out again. You know, it's, it's so um, so on a knife edge. Who are you working for um, for that one, Sam? Um, yeah, it's five live. I think that it's an around the grounds type show. Um, I think so. It's going to be obviously our Champions League will take precedent, but obviously with the games at the the summit of League One, um, big game at Portsmouth, isn't there as well tomorrow night for them to be potentially crowned, promoted, pr- crowned, promoted. That's a football cliche gone wrong, isn't it? Um, and obviously with with our game as well, they're going to be keeping across that. So yeah, and all of a sudden, you know, a week ago, I thought that. You know, it wouldn't be a dead rubber, but it might be a bigger game for Preston. All of a, all of a sudden, it's a massive game for for the Saints as well. So, yeah, looking forward to this. Um, that was a massive game for Preston, as my mate um, reiterated to me last week. He's when I read his uh, his WhatsApp out, and yeah, Preston just couldn't quite get it done, could they? And I think, I think he went for it a little bit, Ryan Lowe, by all accounts, and there was just maybe, you know, an example of Norwich's. Um, probably experience, probably, you know, kind of slightly savvier with the ball. And I think when he went for it, took some midfield players off and got his forward players on there, which you would expect because they're almost approaching needing snookers times. Um, I think Norwich were able to pick him off and obviously managed the game pretty well. And um, Preston didn't finish, you know, making chances and really knocking on the door. So, it might have to be that way from the off tomorrow. We'll see. You know, not every manager would see it like that. And you can you could probably make an argument for the game plan being let's keep it tight, let's frustrate, let's take it to the latter stages and try and nick something. But I think you probably have to open up and make it a bit of a basketball game quite early tomorrow because Preston need to win. So, now it should be an open game. Looking forward to it. Very, very much so. We are going to go chapter and verse on the next round of games in the prediction show, which will be out on Wednesday. But we will, because we haven't dealt with the playoff um, race, although that seems to be the most straightforward to deal with. We will, before we round this out today, give you a a player to watch. Let's say something really unfair about Aussie 2 fan. Certain players, when the sun's out, you know, start of the season, end of the season, they just turn on the style, don't they? And um, I think the goal and assist for Tufan early in the game for Hull um, pricked my attention up. So we had him at the start of the season, didn't we, in the sunshine? I think he scored a hat-trick and he scored a mm. worldie possibly in, in that game as well. Um, talk to me about Aussie Tufan, who's going to be our player to watch. Talk to me about Hull. But more over the playoff race, which may have been shut down by Norwich at the weekend. Yeah, it was a massive win for them, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I was surprised to see, you know, Hull racking up a little bit of a scoreline at home against QPR. And yeah, I mean, if the season was to go on a little bit longer with the lap returning, you'd probably say that that Hull would have maybe got maybe slightly closer to their their um their goal um it looks like they're going to fall short doesn't it but i mean this was a resounding win against a pretty abject qpr um yeah two fans scored that that early season hat trick didn't he there was one goal in particular against sheffield wednesday if memory serves which was was outstanding um and he's had to play a lot of football kind of as a false nine um in this quite kind of sophisticated whole city lineup in the absence of a of a striker so I mean, naturally, as we saw at the weekend, he likes to pull left, likes to link the play, um, and, and he's very technically adept footballer. So, no surprise to get him to see him get a goal like this. And um, they've still got a chance, haven't they? They've still got a chance. Um, Watford away, Coventry away, Ipswich at home, Plymouth away. Difficult, difficult last few few games for them, but. Um, I think, despite clearly Liam Rossinia being helped in January and now the squad having a real classy look to it, I think it will still be a season well done if they are just to just to miss out. But absolutely, in the absence of you know really recognised strikers over the last few months, Tufan, along with a few others, has 
has really stepped up. And, you know, I've been quite critical that they haven't really clicked, you know, those players um, that were brought in in January. But I think we're seeing signs now that they really have got the firepower and the front players to, to hurt anyone. So it's not over yet, but it's going to take some into the season for them. I just think, Sam, um, if you take into account, so we've got a six-point gap for Norwich, who are banging form. And if you actually bring, and I'll do it right now, the Norwich fixtures up, they've got next two games, a home to Bristol City and home to Swansea. And if you're Hull or Coventry chasing, and I know they play one another, you're going to need Norwich probably to be scoring a maximum of two points in those particular games whilst you, you know, win your game in hand and, you know, bang on another sort of four to six on top. Um, only question to you, Sam, is uh, we've joked um, West Brom being perpetually in fifth. You actually see Norwich overtaking West Brom now and finishing in fifth. Well, maybe, yeah. I don't know. There's just something, something like I never like kind of betting against West Brom, if you like. And even though they're going to to Leicester, I think it's 12.30 kickoff at the weekend, you, you wouldn't be surprised if they turned up there and frustrated and got something on the counter-attack. And that's you know, kind of what the manager can do in these in these big games. But yeah, there's a, there's an opportunity. And I don't think Norwich are, uh, have been beaten, have they, uh, uh, um, at Carroll Road this year, have they not? I think it's maybe it's 10 games. In November, or, wasn't it? Yeah, 10 games or something now. So they go into, you know, essentially games against two teams that have got nothing to play for um, in the prime spot. And yeah, I think for the last, what, fortnight or so, I think we've both been pretty clear that Norwich are our clear favourites to be finishing in sixth. And I think they are destined to do so. There we go. We'll see. We, we think the... Um... We think the relegation and the promotion are impossible to call. And we think the playoffs are, you know, a little bit clearer. But um, I'm sure it will probably be the other way around. Right. Um, if you've got any questions for Sam, I'm sure he'll do one or two. Um, so stick them in the comments now with a cue before and a question mark afterwards to help me out. And we have a couple of questions on our own um, in the week that was. Right, um, Sam, These are this is our weekly uh, quiz um, curated by the wonderful uh, Fev's Football Analytics on Twitter, uh, at Fev's Football. Can't remember what the score is. Did I win last week or did we, we drew last week, didn't we? The score much... is 17.5 to 14.5. So closer than the predictions then, yeah? Yeah, there's a bit of a margin there for me now, mate, for you to make up, isn't there? Which we'll get on to on Wednesday. But, Sam, in the week that was, um, and get your answers in via the comments, would you like to um, ask me first or would you like to be asked first? I'll ask you first, mate. So okay, it's um, close my phone up so I'm not cheating. It's a topic called Round of Shots. And my question for you is, uh, it's broken down into three. Okay, so number one, which team needed the most shots to win at the weekend? Which team had the most shots in their victory at the weekend? Southampton. Incorrect. Shall I give you the answer? Yeah, yeah. go on. Not the context, don't we? Swansea had 16 shots in their win over Rotherham. Oh. Okay, so naught from one. Which team needed the most shots to draw their game at the weekend? Which team had the most shots in their draw at the weekend? Ipswich Town. The smirk gives it away. Yeah. <laughs> Ipswich, 21 shots for their 1-1 one, one with Borough. And which team had the most shots despite losing their game? Oh, surely it's Leicester or Leeds, isn't it? Surely, surely, surely. Leeds United. Correct. Yes. Well done, mate. They had 19 shots in that defeat against Blackburn. Two from um, three. Oh, not bad. Not bad. Pretty, pretty good. Um, right, your question for Sam. Oh, you've got the you've got the inverse. Okay, so it's round of shots again. Which team needed the fewest shots to win at the weekend? Oh, I bet. Um, I've got two. I think it's probably between Argyle and Sunderland. I'm going to go. Did Plymouth have any shots at all? 
It's got to be Plymouth. It is not. Blackburn Rovers beat Leeds oh, United. I said it earlier. <laughs> We've just shots, three we? shots. Oh. Um, so, uh, which team needed the fewest shots to record a draw? And you can look back at the results if that helps. Oh, God, that's hard, isn't it? That's really yeah. hard. Um, immediately, I'm thinking Bristol City or Stoke. Um, Ipswich Borough. Borough must have had a few. We've seen them. It's got to have come from those two games. Okay. I think Bristol City probably had the fewer there. I think probably Stoke had the fewer there. Oh, God. Uh, is that the only ones? I'm going to go for Stoke. That's a great shout. It's a hell of a shout, actually. It's correct. Yeah. Oh. So you can tie this up now. Which team had the fewest shots in defeat at the weekend? I've got a smile because I'm pretty confident. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> got to be, got to be poor Rotherham, isn't it? It is poor old Rotherham. You've pulled that back. Um, that's tremendous. They were very good questions and a very um, creditable draw. Sam, are you happy to take a couple of questions from the hey, that, chat? That does show that we do a little bit of prep, doesn't it? There, because I, you know, that was good. Oh, I, had mate, to, I, was... I had to dig deep for that, and you know, just something in my mind said. You know, you, you just like something in my, there was something there in my mind that I just, I just read that Stoke hadn't had much on goal or something like that. And Bristol Bev City, is in so. the chat. So big thanks to legend Bev. You've been brilliant all season. Every week we move, we move around the um, recording times. He always gets the questions in 18.15 to Sam. Um, right. Uh, let's take some questions. Can you take a couple of questions, Sam? You got time? Yeah, mate. Yeah. Uh, Stuart, uh, what team would you want to be part of in the top four now and why? I mean, quite enjoy playing for all of them, wouldn't you, Sam? Who would I want? What team would you want to be yeah, part of? Yeah, who would you like of? to play up front for in the top four? Um, Bearing in mind you buried the Leicester strikers today. You should probably say you, Leicester. No, no, def definitely not Leicester at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's the old poison chalice, isn't it? Um Probably still Leeds, just. Yeah, just. I think Southampton could be quite frustrating as well. You've got to probably be a certain type. He's a poacher, isn't he, Che Adams? Um, Armstrong's obviously played a slightly different role. I just think probably in Leicester and Southampton's teams, you'd get, you've got to be that kind of, you've got to be okay about not having too many touches, maybe, and just waiting, waiting, waiting for the final third. Whereas Leeds, I think maybe you'd be, involved in the setup a little bit more and you got great wide players haven't you and Nonto and James and and Somerville to hopefully provide for you so maybe just them but and Ipswich I just think I don't know I wouldn't want to you got a lot was, of running to do there Sam oh yeah maybe there's that and I don't know I was going to say the tension but there's expectation of all of them isn't there at the there moment is. I don't know I just think yeah maybe Leeds um Wilco how was your meal in Plymouth did Jamie Mackey give a good suggestion <sighs> My other half suggested that going down to Plymouth and spending the Loads whole... Of people, by the way, sorry to interrupt, Sam. Loads of people suggested the same place as well. Oh, I meant they? to say in the oh. comments. Yeah, it was a real popular place, yeah, that I'd... everyone suggested you went to. I'm going to really upset a few people from Plymouth now. I'd earmarked um, a couple of restaurants on the harbour. I just wanted to go and have some seafood. But then my other half said, like, you don't want to get down there at one, two o'clock. And then what are you going to do the whole afternoon? Um, so what I actually did, I just potted around in London for a bit at home and I stopped at a David Lloyd just on the outskirts of Exeter on the way down. And, uh, it was that glorious day, wasn't it? It was like 20 degrees. So I just, uh, had a swim, did some, something in the gym and, uh, got a few rays and then I went down, got parked and had a little walk around the, um, the area near the ground and then went in in good time for my pasty. Um, but I didn't spend... <laughs> Probably as much time as I threatened to in Plymouth. So apologies next time. But I mean, yeah, to um to blow smoke a little bit. Like the atmosphere is brilliant there. One one of the, yeah. you know, like off the top of my head, it's difficult, but one of the best kind of match day experiences I think I probably had this year. I was there for the Southampton game in late August and then again there. And just where you're positioned as well on the radio, you're right almost with the supporters. So it was so loud. It, it was great. Yeah. Really, really good. So uh, what I lacked in sightseeing um, was made up for with the atmosphere. Sorry. Right. Last one, um, Streaky94. 
How does a manager of a team who struggled the last few matches and are on the edge of relegation or promotion, oh, that's interesting, go about training? Uh, would you just keep the routine exactly the same or or shake it up? You want a, mm. you want a reaction at the top or the mm. bottom, Sam? What happens? Be- I know the Ipswich players mm. have got a few days off mm. now, so they're shaking it up with the two-week break. I wonder, Daniel Farker's got until Monday night with Leeds, hasn't he? So probably... Mm. You know, wait, give me your thoughts. I think everyone's everyone's so different. Everyone's so different. You know, some managers would maybe think it was a, a good opportunity to to completely have a change and maybe even do something off the pitch like team bonding, take the lads out or whatever, get everyone together. You know, I've played for managers that would absolutely do that in this scenario. Um, but but the other side of the coin is just not 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 changing anything not affecting too much um i think between the end of the season and the playoffs that's that's different you know once the 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 season is done a lot of managers will think about taking the players away um uh, and refocusing that way as it would be before maybe a cup semi final or before a final just get it's a change different. of scenery it's, it's tournament tournament football isn't it you've got yeah. to approach it differently haven't you yeah yeah i think so so i don't think my answer would probably be on the training ground you know yeah there'll be little tactical changes and what have you but it'd probably be more something off the pitch you know to try and galvanize the players before the last week or two of the season especially you know Ipswich having the luxury of some time off now so I wouldn't be surprised maybe if if that was um you know within the managers thinking but on the training ground I think they just stick to what they've been doing and getting them success and then yeah the teams that are in the playoffs gives you a nice luxury to to maybe think outside the box maybe I lied we just do one more uh column Surely every championship fan has to be behind Coventry to beat Manchester United at the weekend. How good would that be, Sam? Whoever whoever you support, that would be incredible. Um, what are your thoughts on on their on their chances? Oh man, it's just like I talk about my mind being a bit frazzled earlier about the championship. I mean, watching Manchester United does that to me as well. I mean, just <laughs> like what on earth is it? Do you know what I mean? They're just even at Stanford Bridge the other day, there was just ultimate chaos. That was a band, wasn't it, in the 90s? Was, say a yeah. band. It was a boy band. K-A-O-S, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, absolute mayhem. Zero defensive shape. You know, de- zero balance in the midfield. Yet, of course, some unbelievable, gifted, technical, brilliant yeah. footballers. So it just probably counteracts it even like Anthony that game I watched who's like you know he's um he's the been like the whipping boy this season really not even for the Man United supporters you know everyone likes chipping in and saying how terrible he is I mean seeing him in the flesh he is sharp you know incredibly sharp Mainu as well brilliant player um so they've clearly got that but give them a chance they will give them a chance so yeah commentary I don't know exactly what the lineup was at the weekend. I've not poured over that um, because it was more about Birmingham. But obviously, the way that Wright and Sims, for for example, have finished the season, you know, they'll go into it really confident. And you know, some of the lads, certainly the staff, prepared for a big game at Wembley not so long ago. So, yeah, hopefully for everyone uh, of a championship supporting persuasion, uh, can get behind commentary at the weekend and they can cause a shock. Sensational. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, everybody. Um, we were um in an hour in, weren't we, Sam, about putting this live at this point in the day? But it's been brilliant. The chat's been exceptional as ever. Um, if you're listening or watching after the fact, then please give it a thumbs up and a five-star review over on the podcast. Um, Sam, last word from you. Is anything off limits going to be surprising you when we're sat here mm-hmm. again next Monday? No, nah, I'm I'm all for I'm on the the, the the Saints train now. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, let's have Saints win the next two. Sorry, Preston fans, and uh, let's set up a four horse race for the last week or two of the season. And let's have Coventry in the Cup final as well. Thank you, everybody, for watching the Championship Check In podcast.